Welcome back. Let's now look at the events on day six of this third episode of Creation Week, where we will learn about the land animals that God created. So you can read most of this on pages 27 to 34 of the book. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. On the first Friday, our Almighty Creator God created every single land animal by simply commanding the earth to bring forth living creatures. And so the earth suddenly teemed with an incredible variety of land animals. Wolves and elephants, squirrels and antelope, rabbits and monkeys, mice and giraffe, frogs and lizards, cats and crocodiles. And you know what? All of them lived in peace with one another. On this special day, God also made a very interesting group of animals. And that is, of course, the dinosaurs. However, the word dinosaur is not mentioned in the Bible. But the words cheetah, kangaroo, and genet are not mentioned in the Bible either. Yet we know that they truly exist. The word dinosaur actually means terrible lizard. Because when scientists first saw their bones, they could see that they looked different. Almost like huge lizards. But this is a bit of a misnomer. Since dinosaurs were not huge lizards, but rather they were unique land reptiles. Lizards and snakes are part of the order Squamata and they are also classified under reptiles. So reptiles are simply a more general classification or description which includes lizards and snakes. Probably the major visual characteristic or feature that distinguishes dinosaurs from typical lizards is that they walk with upright legs and not the sideways legs of typical reptiles, including some lizards. The Bible teaches that God made all the land animals on the sixth day. This includes the reptiles and therefore also the dinosaurs. Although many people believe that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, in other words, long before people even existed. The Bible teaches that death came into the world because of Adam and Eve's sin. It's also called the fall. Furthermore, the Bible teaches that the fall only took place approximately 6,000 years ago. So how could anything have died before that time? In other words, 65 million years ago, if the earth is only about 6,000 years old and sin and death did not exist yet. Let's confirm this from the Bible. Romans 5.12 When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Did you know that God described two dinosaurs in quite some detail in the Bible? Although, as I mentioned earlier, the word dinosaur is not specifically mentioned in the Bible. And here is the reason why. The people who translated the Bible did so in the 1500s and 1600s. So that's about 500 years ago. Sir Richard Owens only invented the word dinosaur in the 1800s. So that's about 200 years ago, but it's almost 400 years after the first Bible translations were done. Although the word dinosaur is not specifically mentioned in the Bible, the word dragon is definitely used more than 30 times in the King James translation. Modern translations such as the New International Version uses the word monster. So what people called dragons and monsters were probably dinosaurs before the word dinosaur existed. I mean, look for example at this one. It's called Dracarex Hagwortsia. Dracarex means dragon king. The nearly complete skull, along with several neck vertebrae, were discovered in the 
Hell Creek Formation, no less, in South Dakota in 2003. And it is probably the closest thing to what most people consider to be a dragon. Yet this is a real animal. Worldwide, there are historic references to these dragons. For example, King George fought a dragon which is today identified as a dinosaur called a Notosaurus. Alexander the Great's army was scared off by a dinosaur in a cave. And Marco Polo reported seeing a dinosaur while visiting China. It is interesting to see how Chinese historians show dinosaurs along with other known animals on the Chinese zodiac. Then we have cave drawings, tapestries and carvings of dinosaurs showing that people knew what they looked like because they were alive at the same time. We'll talk more on this in a later episode. Now, even though we are busy with the creation events on day six, let's briefly jump ahead in biblical history to Job 40 and 41, where we read about Behemoth and Leviathan. Some translations mistakenly call Behemoth either an elephant, because it is the largest land animal today, or a hippopotamus, because they sometimes live in marshy areas. But the fossil record, which you will learn about later, clearly confirms the fact that elephants are definitely not the la largest land animals that God created. Elephants are dwarfed by some of the biggest dinosaurs. Now let's read in the New King James Version and in the New Living Translation how God described this giant animal. Look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips, and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. It is a prime example of God's handiwork, and only its creator can threaten it. The mountains offer it their best food, where all the wild animals play. It lies under the lotus plants hidden by the reeds in the marsh. The lotus plants give it shade among the willows beside the stream. It is not disturbed by the raging river, not concerned when the swelling Jordan rushes around it. No one can catch it off guard or put a ring in its nose and lead it away. Now there is a very important clue in this text where the tail of this animal is compared to a cedar tree. Now this is a tree known in the Bible for its size and strength, which is why it is a very strong indication that this animal was absolutely enormous in size. Look at the following two photos. Not the little stump of the hippo, nor the cord-like tail of the elephant look at anything like the huge, strong, straight to triangular shape of a cedar tree. The description does, however, strongly resemble that of a brachiosaurus, a sauropod type of dinosaur. And as you can see, elephants and hippos are absolutely dwarfed by the enormous size of this animal. Sauropods had very long necks, long tails, small heads, and four pillar-like thick legs. They are notable for their enormous sizes of some species and they are in all probability the largest land animals that God ever created. In fact, the largest sauropod discovered is estimated to have weighed about 76 tons. That is a weight of about 12 to 13 elephants. These enormous creatures had to eat about half a ton of vegetation every day. Also, verse 16 says that his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. Yet the elephant's strength is in its head, namely its trunk and neck. In fact, it carries about 60% of its weight on its front legs, not on its hind legs. In contrast, Scientists have discovered that the center of mass in sauropods is closer to the rear and that they have much larger hind legs compared to the front legs. 
The text describes how Behemoth's bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. The more common meaning of the word beams is strong and mighty. So this text seemed to indicate that the bones were so firm that they seemed to be made of solid metal. In contrast, the bones of hippos have a marrow cavity that actually makes up 55% of the total thickness of its femurs. This is less than most mammals, but it still helps hippos to walk on the bottom of rivers. Elephant bones also have cavities with spongy bone in them. But the sauropod dinosaurs were unique because many of them had ribs and limb bones that were not hollowed out like most animals, but it was solid bone. So clearly, this description in Job does not fit hippos and elephants. Yet you have to wonder about that long neck. How was it able to lift up that neck if the bones were solid and heavy? Well, in contrast to the solid bones of the legs and ribs, researchers have discovered that the vertebrae, the neck bones, are increasingly lighter with increasing height because they are filled with a honeycomb pattern of air of up to 90%. So that is so light, it's comparable to styrofoam. Now you may be wondering why God described this magnificent and impressive animal in such detail. To understand that, let's briefly have a look at Job's life. Job was a man of God. He lived a peaceful, blessed life that was filled with happiness because he lived according to God's will and law. God was very proud of Job because he was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and he stayed away from evil. This means that Job was sincere. He did not pretend to be a child of God. He really was one. And his life of integrity testified to that fact. You see, it is no use to simply say that you are a child of God. You, shouldn't, you should not need to say it at all. Your life and how you treat other people every moment should clearly show it. We should do what is right and behave like children of God, especially when we think that no one else can see us. In the same way that a tree bears good fruit, we must bear good fruit so that other people can see we are God's children. Those fruits are described in Galatians 5.22 as love, joy, peace, long-suffering, that means patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. With God's help, these are the fruits that we should bear. That means no temper tantrums when we don't get our way. Job 1 and 2 further tells of Satan who claimed that Job was only faithful to God because things were really going well in his life and because he benefited from the relationship. Satan then challenged God by claiming that if Job's property and loved ones were taken away, Job would turn against God. We then learn how Job's faith was tested to the uttermost. God allowed Satan to take Job's possessions, family, and laborers, but Job remained faithful to God. Satan was definitely not satisfied and was probably extremely disappointed because Job had remained faithful to God. He then went back to God and claimed that Job would become unfaithful if his health was taken away as well. The rest of the book of Job describes the story of how he struggled to understand why how all these terrible things were happening to him. Job had many questions and in the end God answered him directly and in a very interesting manner by asking him 77 rhetorical questions and every question dealt with God's creation. By the way, the purpose of a rhetorical question is to make a point rather than to get an answer. You can read about that starting in Job 38. Now in his answer to Job, God reminded Job and us 
about all the wonderful aspects of his marvelous creation, such as the behemoth, which was the first of the land animals. This means it was the foremost, the chief, the first in rank. So God is pointing Job to the magnificence of his creation by firstly pointing out the largest and most magnificent animal that ever lived on earth, the behemoth. And then he describes the most fearsome king of beasts, the Leviathan. Leviathan is also a symbol for Satan. Now by doing so, God teaches us that only he who is God can overcome and achieve victory over Satan, who is also a created being. We are reminded that God still remains in control of our lives, even when Satan attempts to destroy us. Now, the strange thing about the book of Job is that after all these accusations from chapters 1 and 2, the story seems to end without Satan being directly mentioned again. Which brings us to the description of Leviathan in Job 41. Now, if you read the description of Leviathan and understand that this is probably a description of a specific created animal that is used as a symbol for Satan, as mentioned, just like a dragon and a snake is used in other places as a symbol for Satan, then it becomes clear that this description of a real and existing animal literally refers to Satan. In Job 41, we find the detailed description of this enormous aquatic animal. So let's read that together. Can you catch Leviathan with a hook or put a noose around its jaw? Can you tie it with a rope through the nose or pierce its jaw with a spike? Will it beg you for mercy or implore you for pity? Will its hide be hurt by spears or its head by a harpoon? If you lay a hand on it, you will certainly remember the battle that follows. You won't try that again. No, it's useless to try and capture it. The hunter who attempts it will be knocked down. And since no one dares to disturb it, who then can stand up to me? Who has given me anything that I need to pay back? Everything under heaven is mine. I want to emphasize Leviathan's limbs and its enormous strength and graceful form. Who can strip off, off its hide and who can penetrate its double layer of armor? Who could pry open its jaws for its teeth? The King James Version says double brittle are terrible. Its scales are like rows of shields tightly sealed together. They are so close together that no air can get between them. Each scale sticks tight to the next. They interlock and cannot be penetrated. When it sneezes, it flashes light. Its eyes are like the red of dawn. Lightning leaps from its mouth. Flames of fire flash out. Smoke streams from its nostrils like steam from a pot heated over burning rushes. Its breath would kindle coals for flames shoot from its mouth. The tremendous strength in Leviathan's neck strikes terror wherever it goes. Its flesh is hard and firm and cannot be penetrated. When it rises, the mighty are afraid, gripped by terror. No sword can stop it, no spear, dart or javelin. Arrows cannot make it flee. Clubs are like blade of grass and it laughs at the swish of javelins. Its belly is covered with scales as sharp as glass. It plows up the ground as it drags through the mud. Leviathan makes the water boil with its commotion. It stirs the depth like a pot of ointment. The water glistens in its wake, making the sea look white. Nothing on earth is its equal. No other creature is so fearless. Of all the creatures, it is the proudest. It is the king of beasts. Wow! So the king of beasts is not the lion after all. Now before we attempt to identify this animal, Let's briefly look at a very interesting little insect, the Bombardier beetle. This tiny beetle is capable of producing and firing a steaming hot, noxious gas through twin exhaust tubes in his tail in any direction his enemy might be. He can even aim and fire right over his head. 
Now this is done by mixing all sorts of concoctions, chemicals and catalysts in a bomb preparation or reaction chamber in his hindquarters. And yes, this bomb preparation chamber is a bit more dangerous than yours. When the beetle is threatened, the muscles around the two chemical storage chambers contract and the chemicals flow into the reaction chamber. The pressure mounts due to the reaction between the chemicals, which causes the one-way valves to close and the outlet valves to open instantly with a loud pop. The reaction between the chemicals happens very rapidly, within 90 milliseconds, before spewing out at 20 meters per second. This tiny insect cannon can fire away four to five of these bombs at intervals of less than four minutes, and this bomb can even render larger enemies such as spiders, mice, frogs and birds temporarily unconscious, giving the little beetle time to make its great escape. Now let's get back to Job's Leviathan. If this bomb mechanism is still in existence today, surely it's more than possible that it existed in the past as well, don't you think? Many interpreters consider the word Leviathan to refer to a crocodile, not because that is what the word means, but based on the description of Leviathan, which they consider to be that of a crocodile. Now, there are many different ideas regarding its identity. Some thought it was a Tyrannosaurus rex, but T. rex was land-living, while Leviathan was aquatic, freshwater and marine. Others thought it was a Chronosaurus, but Chrono was a fully marine animal that probably lived in the deep ocean, so it doesn't make sense for such an animal to be an opponent to land-living people with swords, spears and arrows. Furthermore, Chronosaurus had flippers, not legs, so he could not stand or move on land and he could not have left trails in the mud at the water's edge, as described in Job. Now, with the exception of Australia's saltwater crocodile, which spends some time in the sea, crocodiles are not usually found in the sea, but rather they are found in rivers and lakes. By the way, today's crocodile scales are not nearly thick enough to withstand a spear. Leviathan was probably a Sarcosuchus imperata, a monstrous armored type of crocodile, which they nicknamed Super Croc. The first Tupacroc fossil was discovered in the Sahara Desert in 1966. This animal had an unusual ball-shaped opening at the front of its snout, and scientists speculate that it might have been the preparation chamber for the mixing of various fire-generating chemicals, very similar to that of the Bombardier beetle. An article on this discovery was presented in the December 2001 publication of National Geographic and the description of this animal is remarkably similar to that which is given in Job. The skin was described as gorgeous armor with foot-long bony scales that looked like they were very densely packed roofing tiles to form an impenetrable shield around the animal's neck, back and tail. They write that it is especially the skull with which nothing else can compare. It had more than a hundred teeth in its mouth, and in contrast to crocodiles alive today, the skull of super croc becomes wider towards the front, where it's further armed with a row of deadly enlarged canines. Do you remember how the King James Bible described Leviathan's double brittle teeth? Now, the force of this bite is estimated to be a whopping eight tons, eight metric tons. So just to compare, humans have a bite force of about 120 kilograms. Hyenas have a bite force of about 918 kilograms, and a saltwater crocodile has a bite force of around 1.6 tons. So clearly, Super Croc was in a biting class of its own. The complete skull is almost two meters long. This 13 meter long armored reptile with its two meter long head and frightening teeth, eight tons of bite force that 
probably exhaled smoke and fire, sounds like an excellent candidate for the Leviathan of the Bible. What do you think? In the second part of day six, we will learn about the creation of mankind. Thank you.